I should say, I guess, a little bit about myself, uh, since this has sort of, over the years, turned into a kind of a one-man band. Um, I grew up in a small town in Colorado uh, under extraordinarily ordinary circumstances. Uh, and uh, for some reason, I don't know, genetic or something in the water or something, I was always uh, very prone to obsession. And one obsession gave way to another so that rock collecting gave way to butterflies, which gave way to rocketry, which gave way to girls, which gave way to drugs, which gave way to politics, on and on and on. Fascinated with the world, and as a rock hunter and a butterfly collector, it was fairly aesthetically driven and irrational. What interested me was the iridescence in certain agates, certain pyrites, certain tropical butterflies, certain kinds of reef fish, something about the light, the visual thrill of, uh, of the world. And this took me through many places by the time I was 14 years old and read Aldous Huxley's book, The Doors of Perception, where he gives a very restrained and gentlemanly description of a masculine experience. And I took it at face value and said, you know, if, if this is even partially true, it's immensely important. And I began to pursue uh, this vast area of interlocking disciplines that really has no name, but we can name the disciplines, and you know what I'm talking about. Botany, ethnography, chemistry, DNA function, uh, cultural dynamics, shamanism, linguistics, theories of natural magic, relationship of man to the environment, the, so forth and so on. The, the, the nexus of concerns that clusters around the question, what are we, where did we come from, and where are we going? And as a 14-year-old, 16-year-old, when these questions first form in your mind, a reasonable response is to seek the cultural database. Surely there are answers to these questions. Who are we? Where did we come from? And where are we going? Well, if you have any kind of intellectual uh, filter at all, you quickly can satisfy yourself that, that our best efforts are nothing more than half-completed stories told around the campfire. We don't actually know what our predicament is. I mean, we are up against a phenomenon which we can barely bring into focus in our cognitive sphere, and it's the phenomenon of our own existence. You know, what, what does it mean? What does it mean, first of all, to be a biological creature, to be as an animal? What is that? And then, what is it to be that embedded then in a culture with, a, with histories and languages and aesthetic canons and literatures and scientific uh, uh, hypotheses about the cosmos and so forth and so on? And my personal journey, if you want to put it that way, lay through a successive series of, um, I almost, would, almost said disappointments, but awakenings could be another word, as I realized that nobody has their finger on what's going on. These religions that are so freighted with their own pomposity are no better than inspired guesses. And science works its miracles 
by turning its enterprise into a kind of parlor game confined to the category matter and energy. So you can live and die inside these intellectual structures uh, if you choose to. But people of curiosity, people of unusual or traveled circumstance usually find themselves unsatisfied with the conventional answers. And then, on top of all that, you can add the fact that over the last hundred years, what has come into the toolbox of, of thinking Westerners is a whole array of consciousness-altering substances that were not there before. And th they accelerate, accentuate the, the dissolution of sanctioned uh, paradigms, basically. In other words, all these things you might cling to, Catholicism, democratic ideals, Hasidism, Marxism, Freudianism, you know, all of these things are exposed as simply quaint cultural artifacts painted masks and rattles assembled by uh, people of good intent, but clearly not great uh, grasp of the situation. Well, over, I, I thought that that process of deconstruction of cultural reality would end in a kind of liberation of cynicism, where you become sort of really street smart. You know, nobody can put anything over on you. You've been there. You've done that. Uh, it turns out that that existential phase, which I reached at about age 18, is itself simply a place along the way. And that persisting then with pushing into altered states of mind and alien cultures uh, I began to see that there was a, a, there was a landscape of meaning, but it was not the meaning that I had ever been told. And this was fairly shocking to me because part of my intellectual journey had been through the psychology of Carl Jung. So I was very prepared for the idea that all dreams, all religious mythologies are seamlessly connected to each other under the surface. And uh, liberalism takes the generous position that everybody has a piece of the action. You know, the Buddhists understand something, the Taoists understand something, the Kabbalists understand something. I was getting a different message. I was getting the message that nobody understands anything, that the entire cultural enterprise is 180 degrees cockamamie to the truth, that we have it absolutely ass backwards, that to date the enterprise of thinking has moved us radically away from understanding anything. and. Uh, over the years, I've tried to make room for this alternative explanation. And I suppose this is the proper place in all this to make my standard declaimer against squirreliness. Uh, there's a lot of squirreliness in this world, a rising tide of it. Uh, some of it has been fomented not far from where we sit this evening. Uh, <clears throat> and I, I, I represent to myself, and I hope to convince you of this, radical ideas, innovative ideas, even peculiar ideas, but not loose or preposterous ideas. Uh, and it's sort of like as Supreme Court Justice Douglas said of pornography, it's hard to define, but you know it when you see it. And, and that, that's 
so as sanctioned paradigms break down, science and religion, which certainly are breaking down, into that vacuum rushes an incredibly exotic menagerie of intellectual uh, freakery of all sorts. And so what, what you have to call into being to deal with that situation are rules of evidence tools for telling shit from Shinola, in other words. And though what I will say here may sound peculiar, none of it is beyond the realm of testability. And none of it is riddled, I hope, with uh, contradiction. So uh, these weekends serve different functions for different people just in the course of doing what I've done with my scene, I know a lot about plants and uh, anthropological use of psychoactives and chemistry and anecdotal stuff. And I'm very happy to share all that with you, right down to recipes and how to do it because I, that's very important to empower people's personal toolkits and technology. Uh, at first, I had great enthusiasm for that part of the teaching process because I felt I was alone in trying to get people to take high doses of psychedelics and pay attention, you know, that this was not a party experience. Uh, this was something uh, at the edge of metaphysical profundity. It now appears that psychedelic exploration is alive and well, enshrined in the culture as a 3% minority to be tolerated approximately with the same level of toleration granted to advanced s &M practitioners. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so that has been taken care of. And, and so what interests me more now is, for me, what all these years of psychedelic taking came to was a new model of how reality works, a new model of what the world is. And several people in going around the circle referred to it tonight as the time wave or, or talk about time and the I Ching. I represent... A, Remember when we were kids, or it still continues today, but there is a genre of cartoon of the bearded, corpulent man in the robe carrying a sign which says something. Usually the end is near and repent. Well, how a rationalist, a Platonist, and an admirer of uh, all kinds of evidentiary veracity could find their way into that position, I don't know. But that is the position I'm in. I really am quite convinced, I, I wouldn't say 100%, but that what we are experiencing here at the end of the 20th century, which we call chaos or cultural speed up or globalization or you know just the concatenation of multiple social crises is in fact something far more profound than a mere crisis in our politics or our management styles or something like that that the it, it is that the cultural world, the world of human culture and his history, is reaching some kind of climax at the same moment that the biological evolutionary process, which has been working on this planet for four billion years, is also reaching a climax. And both of these simultaneous trajectories toward breakthrough are occurring in a yet larger context where the very laws of physics itself are undergoing some kind of a local uh, phase shift or transformation. 
And I am completely aware of how nutty this sounds at first. I mean, any problem you have with this, I had in spades. Uh, first of all, all apocalyptic theory always centers on a moment not far in the future. There's never been any percentage in saying the earth is going to end in 50,000 years. Uh, you, there's just no juice in that. Uh, nevertheless, when you begin comparing ontologies, you've got to always remember it, this is not a free-for-all. Uh, there are only a certain number of intellectual products on the market. Uh, what is science selling? Science is selling the idea that some time ago, for no reason, the earth sprang from nothing in a single moment. Well, now, whatever you may think about that idea, notice that it's the limit case for credulity. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, whether it's true or not, it's the most outlandish explanation for reality possible for the human mind to conceive of. And that's step one with science. So what does this do? What is the consequence of this scientific worldview? A progressive marginalization and de-emphasis on what it means to be a human being because the universe is enormous in space and time. Our galaxy is utterly ordinary, one of billions. Our star is utterly ordinary, one of trillions. Our planet is presumed to be of an ordinary type, and biology is presumed to be a necessary consequence of certain chemical regimes at certain temperatures, and on and on and on. So. What you get then as the human role in this scientific scheme is virtually nothing more to, than to witness, to carry out certain measurements that cause the collapse of the state vector, and to witness. And the universe is an accident, and all subsequent processes are accidents, and we are an accident and value is conferred, and meaning is an illusion of the naive, and on and on and on. This is the legacy of positivism, materialism, uh, the thinking that has gone on in the last 200 years in Europe and now dominates the planet. The problem is that it runs completely counter to the primary datum, to use a philosophical buzzword, the primary datum. And what is the primary datum? It's the felt presence of immediate experience. In other words, being here now is the primary datum. And it doesn't tell you that this is a series of accidents and that you are irrelevant and that your pain is not pain and that your hope is not hope. It tells you something else. It tells you this counts. Somehow it matters. I matter. My life matters. My family, culture, the human enterprise, this planet, its biota, this matters. It all matters. Meaning is intrinsic as a primary datum, and yet it's denied by the philosophy which rules this planet and sets its agenda. How this happened? we can talk about tomorrow. It's an interesting story of, of historical malapropisms and bad calls and lost opportunities and just bonehead stupidity at critical <laughs> uh, junctures. But this evening what I want to evoke for you is what are its consequences? We need a metaphor that can contain the demon of the future that we have conjured into being. Fine-tuning the uh, institutions built by powdered wig guys 200 years ago is a long shot at holding the whole thing together. Uh, the world is entering into a phase of progressively more chaotic oscillation. 
this is not a consequence of, of what human beings have done. It's part of the dynamics of the human biological, geological matrix that represents uh, the planet. Biology never stands still. It moved from the unicellular phase into the multicellular phase. It occupied all niches. It left the oceans. It occupied the land. It then entered into linguistic phase space. It entered into the domain of meaning, and there it erected conscious, reflecting societies and individuals. Now, through the catalytic interaction with technology, the human species is getting set to redefine itself. And uh, the, these phase transitions are major. In the life of this planet, which is four billion years, we can probably look back to no more than half a dozen of these kinds of phase transitions. Uh, well, now I want to return to a point, which was the unlikelihood of apocalyptic transformation in our own time, using a kind of reductionist argument that there is so much time and a life is so short that the odds that your life would fall on the golden moment is very slight. But that's not true if the dice are loaded. And the dice <laughs> are loaded. This melting together of technology, this globalization of culture, this uh, m creation of an electromagnetic sea of information. These are phenomena that only happen in the terminal moments of the planetary breakthrough. History itself is the shockwave of eschatology. This is the slogan that I've been building to deliver to you. History is the shockwave of eschatology. If you don't know what eschatology is, it's a good old theological word. It means the final things, the last things. And what I have learned from psychedelics, and I'm convinced of this to the bone, whether my own mathematics can stand the test or not, but time is not necessarily driven from the past. Time is not like an unfolding avalanche of causal consequences. Time is more like uh, a process drawn toward an attractor. And the reason evolution happened on this planet in such a short amount of time, the reason the emergence of consciousness happened without following all the blind alleys that were open to primate evolution is because it isn't a random walk toward nowhere. It is, in fact, of a trajectory defined by the field through which we are moving. And the way to think of this is like a topological surface, that time is not featureless. It is not invariant, as Newton insisted and assumed in order to build his calculus. I mean, it may appear invariant when you're calculating the orbits of the planets, but anyone who has ever gone through a bankruptcy, a divorce, a love affair, uh, the death of a, a loved one, something like that, knows that you know these things are unique phenomena. Millions of people have died, and nobody has ever died the same way twice and left the people standing there feeling the same way. The things that matter are imbued with uniqueness, and that uniqueness is imparted by this invisible medium that science, in order to function, has had to deny. That's what it basically comes down to. And as we unpack this weekend, we'll talk some about the I Ching, talk about how cultures uh, become obsessed with certain aspects of nature, and then in the act of exploring that obsession very creatively, 
other aspects of nature are completely overlooked or forgotten. For instance, in the West, we are the masters of matter and energy. I mean, when you think that 100,000 years ago we were chipping flint and that we can trigger fusion, the process which lights the stars themselves, that we can trigger fusion in our laboratories as an experimental process, that's absolutely hair-raising. I mean, that is a long, long journey into the heart of matter to be able to pull off a trick like that. Meanwhile, our understanding of time is infantile. We have no theory of time. Uh, we say that it is, uh, in most cases, to be treated as invariant, and if you're working with special relativity, then in the presence of massive gravitational objects, you impart a very slight curvature to the space-time continuum, and that's it for time. And yet time is the dimension that, that hammers at us most uh, persistently. Because, you know, it, it's upon the back of time that you ride into the world and it's grasping for more of it that you sink into the blackness of death itself. Somebody had a question? Mm. Yeah. My English is very poor, so I have to ask. Uh, is it, do you believe in uh, evolution or development? Oh, yeah. One of the words that hasn't escaped my lips tonight by accident is novelty. Novelty is the concept that I've elaborated over the years, taking it from Alfred North Whitehead. But as I see it, being the cosmos, whatever you want to call it, is a struggle between two implacable forces. Novelty on the one side and habit on the other side. And let me describe them for a moment, and then you can see that this is true, I think. What is habit? Habit is doing things the way you've always done them. Habit is tradition. Habit is circular behavior. Habit is following the creodes that have already been laid down by past activity. It's what Sheldrake calls the morphogenetic field. What is novelty? Novelty is self-explanatory. It's what breaks the pattern. New connections, new possibilities. And the universe is in a state of dynamic tension between these two tendencies. Novelty surges forward. New art movements, new technologies, new inventions, new uh, social mores, new classes. And then Habit reasserts itself, close the theaters, kill the Jews, reestablish the old order. And this goes on over and over and over again. But the good news is this is not a Manichaean struggle. This is not an eternal struggle. Novelty is winning. Novelty is winning. Inch by inch, iota by iota, over millions and billions of years, the universe grows more novel, more connected, different temperature regimes, new forms of physical, new domains of physical law, because at first the universe was very hot. You couldn't have organic chemistry. Uh, you couldn't have uh, societies. Well, now, if, if novelty is, a sense, in a sense, what I've described to you is what we could call a novelty-conserving engine. The universe is a novelty-consuming, conserving engine. It produces novelty, and then it acts to hang on to it. And it uses that novelty to build the next level of novelty. So upon matter, it builds long chain polymers, DNA, molecule, it builds organic molecular structure. Upon that, animal life is organized. Upon that, complex sentient higher animals. Upon that, technology using humans. And upon that, the global society that we live in. 
Well, now, notice, something interesting has happened by making novelty our, our uh, value to be conserved. Suddenly, the human enterprise is not peripheral. Suddenly, the human enterprise is what it's all about. The cosmos has been moving its eggs closer and closer to one basket for eons. You know, the action is not now in uh, uh, the bryophytes or the coleocanths or the reptiles. The action now is in a single species of primate. All of nature has halted its activity to turn and watch as Homo sapiens sapien, the double-thinking monkey, takes the stage and begins to work with novelty on a scale like nothing that has ever been seen before. And this, this tool-building function, and I use the word tool in the broadest possible sense, language is a tool, uh, social organization is a tool, but this is what we do. We build tools, and McLuhan very wisely observed these tools are extensions of who we are. They are only distinct from us in our opinion, but in fact, they represent extensions of our humanness. And now, well, for some time, let's say f obviously for about 10,000 years, something really weird has been going on. Uh, because before that, time had an entirely different character. Even in an era when there were people using fire and practicing rituals and chipping stone, my God, the monotony of it. I mean, try to imagine uh, 10,000 years where what happens is you go from flaking on one side to flaking on both sides, and this is hailed in the archaeological record as a staggering cultural advance. I mean, we're talking major boredom on one level. About 10,000 years ago, it began to quicken, and people moved into cities and they began to elaborate specialized and social forms, so forth and so on. Well, then, about a hundred years ago, this went through an order of magnitude of acceleration. And about 15 years ago, it underwent another order of magnitude of acceleration. So we are now living in an entirely different kind of time. Uh, our cultural toolkit is being replaced approximately every 18 months. It, 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 there was a time when it was not replaced every 18,000 years. What do you mean the cultural tools? The tools by which we make our way into the world. For instance, at, in August, I was told, the earth has moved. Mosaic is the most powerful tool ever created for moving human minds around on the web. Three weeks ago I was told, junk mosaic, who needs it? Netscape is the most powerful tool ever created. And you play with Netscape and you compare it to mosaic and you have to admit, yep, it's better, orders of magnitude better. But the rate at which these tools are being replaced is phenomenal. The other thing which is going on is that all kinds of specialties are making breakthroughs that are not being integrated to other specialties. The cultural enterprise is not being managed. It's out of control, which is good news, I think, because if it were under control, it would probably be under the control of someone with plans not terribly uh, pleasant for the rest of us. I think the great good news is that the cultural process is expressing its own dynamic. I'm absolutely phobic of conspiracy theory. I just think it's a silly way to think about reality. God help anybody who tries to seize control of this tiger. Because, yeah. What, um, I don't understand. Why you believe in development? Or this is a premise of you that uh, 
there is time that there is a development for and evolution. Why do you believe in that? Well, uh, because I think the historical record shows a progressive movement from simpler to more complex form. And then the question is, how does it happen? And there are different theories about that. But to, to my mind, it's pretty clear that as you go back in time, the universe becomes a simpler and simpler place. Yeah, but I think we should make clear if if uh, if you if you're thinking if there's time or if there's not time, we should make it clear. Well, <clears throat> this is sort of the question of is there absolute time or is time defined by the uh, systems embedded in it? Uh, it's a philosophical question. I suppose if I were pressed, I would say it's defined by the systems embedded in it. Uh, but I am saying, you see, in, for science, time is not exactly a thing. It becomes somewhat thing-like in relativity because it's mated with space, which is more thing-like than time. But uh, I'm suggesting that time is a real thing as real as electricity or electromagnetic fields, that time, um, he, well, I didn't really intend to get off into this, but briefly, here's the bit. Um, science uses probability theory. That's how, actually what science is. It's a kind of expansion of probability theory. And probability theory says that uh, you know, the first thing you learn when you study probability is that chance has no memory. They drum this into you. So they say to you, if you flip a coin 50 times and it comes up heads 50 times, what are the odds it will come up heads the 51st time? And the correct answer in probability class is 50-50. The odds are always 50-50. But a gambler who had flipped that coin 50 times and seen it come up heads would bet heads and win because there's something funny about that coin. If the odds were really 50-50 of a coin coming up heads or tails, then the most common outcome of a coin toss would be for the coin to land on its edge. And that's the rarest outcome there is in a coin toss. You can hang out in bars your entire life and never see a coin toss land on its edge. Uh, so probability theory is flawed, but the flaws are of such a nature that once you accept probability theory, you will never be able to detect the flaw, because in a sense the theory has preceded the observation. And what I'm saying is that Complex systems, human systems, biological systems, do not operate probabilistically. They operate uh, according to a different rule, which up until recently, the best description we had came from Chinese philosophy. It was called the Tao. And the, the idea there is that there is this invisible force which builds things up, empires, powerful families, you name it, and it tears these things down according to laws which are very, very mysterious and part of the Tao. Well, this time wave thing that I've developed is essentially the Tao without mystery. It strips away all that metaphysical baffle garb and says, here's an algorithm, entirely formal and explicit, that meets all the criteria of Tao. And um, the point that I want to leave you with tonight is that the entertaining, you don't even have to accept these ideas, just the entertaining of these ideas is an empowering experience because it places our historical era and each of us individually at a very critical juncture in the 
uh, alchemical process of cosmic salvation, if you want to put it that way. In other words, a lot is riding on how this all comes out. Yeah. Well, you talked about um, primary experience, one of the things you mentioned. And um, one of my primary experiences has been, I guess what I would call community with nature, that which is not cultural. Um, and I'm wondering how the way you see development and how you see globalization and all that ties into what I assume is similar to that experience that I had that you mentioned, which is the archaic revival. It seems that there's some kind of opposites going on there to me, and I want to know how you tie them together. Well, yes. I mean, what's happening is that we are headed into a kind of super technology a global information society, so forth and so on. But strangely enough, and you have to go back for Mac to McLuhan for this, the sensory ratios that are being reinforced by the new electronic technology are like the sensory ratios that were in place 15,000 years ago. In other words, if print is in fact a cultural disease, or I don't want to know, a condition. Print imposes a condition on the human mind which is now lifting. And as the cloud of print-created conditioning and institutions is lifted, we discover that we are not Victorian ladies and gentlemen, model citizens in the Jeffersonian state, but that we like to trance dance and mess around sexually and get down and dirty and all, all. In other words, there is an archaic impulse that comes into this as we reclaim our senses. Some of you may have read Morris Berman's wonderful book called Coming to Our Senses. Well, I've never met Morris Berman, but I absolutely subscribe to everything said there. Uh, we are... History was an incredibly damaging experience, and now it's over, in a sense. And we're like the victims of a, a very long and uh, prolonged bombardment of some sort. And now it's over, and we can begin to pick up the pieces and say, well, what Christianity did to our sexuality what monotheism did to our gender relationships, so forth and so on. Now we can fix all of this. And, but it, takes the, it, it is this paradoxical enterprise of a neo-archaism taking place in a cyberdelic, hyper-global society. That's why body piercing, tattooing, trance dance, drug experience, uh, sh uh, drumming experiences, all of these things are, I take to be very healthy signs of this archaic impulse coming out in society. I mean, the, what was created by the era of the proper gentleman was, you know, excellent table manners and genocide over most of the surface of the planet. Uh, however, all, all of this, all of these changes that are going on, each one must give way for the next. Like, we are never going to reach any kind of equilibrium between here and the concrescence, this point ahead of us some 18 years in the future where all these biological, cultural, and physical vectors move into phase and create a phase transition. Uh, because in a sense, history is being forced to repeat itself at, a, at an incredibly accelerated rate. And I mean this not as a metaphor, as is ordinarily said. I mean literally that as we approach the omega point, there are a series of recursive reflections, almost like passing through shock waves, where we reiterate past historical episodes. Uh, right now, I take us to be somewhere in the late 800s. You know, Rome has fallen, 
and uh, uh, the, the, the hard claw of the Christian church is just about to close itself over our jugular for about six years or so. Uh, you know, you'll, if you're of our persuasion, your best bet now is to probably move to Tartary till the Renaissance, which comes in 2004. Uh, the point being that we are, we are living through a kind of mini dark age that is actually related to the, the dark ages that descended over Europe at the fall of Rome. We, we could not have one without the other. Time is speeding up, but nevertheless, we have to live through these, uh, these resonances. Yeah. I won't let you go with the time. Um, do you think that we can change history or uh, what we call the past? If you couldn't change history, then you would have a determinism. The problem with determinism is that it makes philosophy impossible. Because if the universe is determined, then you think what you think because you can't think anything else. And that makes the notion of truth rather curious. For truth to exist, there must be the possibility of error. So what I, but, 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 I think that the, the future is more determined than most people think. What is determined in the future is the levels of habit and novelty. They are already set out there ahead of us. What is not set are the events, the people, the inventions, the catastrophes that will fulfill those abstract levels of novelty and habit. Uh, in other words, the future has not yet undergone the formality of actually occurring, but the, the surface on which whatever occurs must be laid over already exists. That's why when we look at the time wave, you'll see People say, you're trying to predict the future. Not exactly. We're trying to predict where in the future the novelty should be expected. But we understand that you can never predict what the novelty will actually be. Uh, but if you could predict where to expect it, you could remove a lot of the anxiety from people's experience of the unfolding of history. Right now, history is an incredibly anxiety-producing process. I mean, I mean, people are just in despair over where we go from here. Yes? Uh, I might be getting a little ahead because I know you're going to talk about um, the time wave tomorrow night, but it occurred to me that when you devise the time wave, what it says is when, basically. It, what it says is when, yes, it answers the when question. I've recently gone through a fu kind of funny change. I mean, this is more addressed to the people who are fairly familiar with this material, but we've put a huge amount of emphasis when we talk about the time wave into uh, the end point, which will occur on December 22nd, 2012 A.D., and we always discuss, you know, what will happen at the end point and so forth and so on. But I've noticed that the curious thing about the time wave is that it will put itself out of business at that moment. Mm -hmm. That regardless of what happens then, the time wave will be, I hate to use the word, history at that <laughs> point. So... We, in a sense, we misuse the time wave if we stand around waiting for 2012 because where the time wave is useful is between here and there because it gives us an accurate map of what I guarantee you is going to be the craziest 18 years this planet has ever seen. And if you don't have a map of some sort through what is about to begin to unpack itself on our doorstep, you will think that it's uh, the, the last days because I think everything that is presently in place will be swept away and then whatever replaces that will be swept away. Uh, so 
part of what I, part, part of my motivation in, in all this is to put the time wave in front of people and say, look, it's worked for thousands and thousands of years and it only has 18 years to go. So how, what intellectual justification is there for denying its efficacy in the next 18 years when it has four plus billion years of success under its belt? And, you know, this will all be thrashed out in the cultural marketplace of ideas. And I'm completely convinced that best ideas win because the you know novelty god is betting on novelty and so if you bet on novelty um, you'll be carried along uh, in that process yeah am yeah. i correct that you uh, predicted the republican win in the house <laughs> well i i said it looked like a good time yeah 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 <laughs> uh, as far as the election is concerned i don't know uh Hawaii gives one a different perspective. I'm living out there now. I, th I, uh, so, I mean, suddenly we all discovered that we were born again Democrats just because they all got kicked out. Before that, a lot of time was spent lashing the Democratic Party as a bunch of jerks. I think probably both impulses were good. Um, I, I think the election just proves that the world corporate state has made national governments irrelevant because, you know, while everybody's yakking about the election, the real news is lowest unemployment in four years, continuous growth into, what, the 27th month? Uh, I mean, Lloyd Benson retired three days ago and said if he could write the numbers, they wouldn't be any different than the numbers he's able to retire on. The economists are, are going berserk. And I think that what has happened very quietly over the past 10 years with chaos theory and fractal mathematics and this sort of thing is that economics has come out of the woodshed. It is not voodoo anymore. And the world corporate state is running a very tight ship. And uh, look at the changes that have gone on just in the past five years. Marxism has been liquidated. Apartheid has been liquidated. The people in the Middle East have been told to get their stupid act together. The Irish question comes up for review. World trade barriers are dropping everywhere. These are all things on the agenda of the world corporate state. Uh, because the world corporate state likes uh, happy, well-paid consumers. War, an instrument of policy by nation states, it is abhorrent to the world corporate state because it busts up assets and requires reinvestment. So I think, you know, if you have a United States senator threatening the life of the president, this tells you that these people are a bunch of irrelevant yahoos. It's like the Parliament of Tonga or something. Uh, it, people like, it, it means they can get up and say anything they damn well please. The president doesn't matter. The Senate doesn't matter. None of it matters. It's a road show, and we're all incredibly focused on it. And why is that? Because an instrumentality of the world corporate state called the media makes very sure that we speak of nothing else. Meanwhile, in the background, um, large changes are being put in place. And I am not, I'm not doctrinaire on this. What we need to find out at this point is not what the Republican Party wants. We need to find out what does the world corporate state believe? Is it simply a slash and burn operation and we're going to peddle ourselves into toxic uh, environmental chaos? Or are there smarter heads in there somewhere who realize that the whole thing has to be managed, otherwise it will turn on itself and, and be uh, inoperable? But uh, 
you know, this, this is what happened a few hundred years ago. The church lost its steam and nationalism arose with a whole new vision of the world and politics and polity and power, and now the world corporate state. Uh, and the most exciting thing going on at the moment, and in, to my mind extremely psychedelic, is, and is the creation of the web and the net. This is potentially what can change the culture, and yet the web and the net is a wholly owned asset of the world corporate state. Uh, however, the net was created by a Cold War mentality and designed to be indestructible. That's why it is indestructible, otherwise they would have destroyed it, you may bet your bottom dollar. But uh, in the era of thermonuclear warfare, they designed it to be indestructible, and now no one can stop it. And I'm in favor of all these runaway processes. I think wherever, wherever management is enslaved to ideology, human values are just stomped on. I mean, that's what happened with Marxism, it's what happens with uh, uh, piratical capitalism, so forth and so on. Um, but I think the, the psychedelic position to take on all this is that it's one hell of a show. And, uh, you know, don't get your heart set on anybody because they'll be swept away as fast as you can say Jack Robinson. Uh, this is, we are not going right or left or any place so conventional. Uh, processes have been set in motion that uh, no no political theory can come to terms with. I think. Well, we could go. <clears throat> last question. Yeah, last question. You went past it a little bit. So, what is your theory? Is it is it uh, the chaos or a smarter mind? Oh, I think probably there's a real war going on inside the world corporate state that it hasn't actually gotten itself together yet. Uh, victory came with unexpected swiftness, and very few people, even you know, inside the Fortune 500 or the World Bank or the IMF, actually understand the degree to which the corporate mentality is now in charge of the planet. I imagine that what it is, is it's a, a struggle between dinosaurs and a, a more ecologically recycle-minded kind of mentality. I'm not a Marxist, but I know enough of Marx to know that in classical capitalistic theory, you can't have capitalism unless you have unlimited exploitable natural resources. <coughs> And, you know, 15 years ago, I would have said capitalism's salvation is space-based resources. Apparently, the people who m manage the money decided not to put money into that, and now there is no infrastructure for the delivery of space-based resources. So, apparently, we're going to try what is called closed-cycle capitalism. And that may be morally dubious because, as far as I can understand, it requires a permanent underclass somewhere. You can't raise everybody to the level of first world consumers because somewhere there has to be somebody working for peanuts manufacturing all this junk. Uh, anyway, the, these are issues. Uh, to me, none of this is far afield. I mean, to me, the psychedelic experience is the experience of trying to make sense of reality. And it used to be, although I can't remember when, that psychedelic self-exploration was presented as a kind of do-it-yourself, courageous psychotherapy. It was a personal voyage. It is only if you don't take it seriously. If you take it seriously, then it, this is not your personal stuff. This is the stuff. And that's how shamans approach it. You know, They wouldn't be able to conceive of what you mean by a personal vision. I mean, there are only visions. And if, 
if psychedelics are on any level to be taken seriously as catalyzers or expanders of consciousness, then we need them because it's an absence of consciousness that is making this historical transition so excruciating. And to the degree that we can raise consciousness, our own and other people's, we can go through this without a lot of yelling and hollering. But people who do not understand what's going on and their numbers will multiply as the chaos spreads are going to require a great deal of, of reassurance. Well, on that thought, I'll send you to bed. Um, let's get together tomorrow morning here at 10 a.m. Thank you all very much. It's a good group. I'm happy to be here.